So thank you everyone for coming here. Uh, my name is Iro Zhang. So we are the uh, we are the tutors here for presenting the tutorial about toward mitigating um, misinformation and social manipulation in large language model era. So unfortunately, due to some weather issues, so uh, Dr. Karishma mm -hmm. Sharma cannot uh, cannot join us to, uh, in this triple W. So basically, we will in this uh, tutorial we will cover some topics about the social manipulation and the uh, uh, and the misinformation uh, mitigation, uh, and then we will talk about the opportunities as well as the challenges brought by large language models on this task. And finally, we will talk about some um, uh, recent uh, advances and also some uh, uh, probable uh, research direction that we can explore to you know make more works and also maybe publish more papers. So thank you so much. Let's start now. So Ijo, do you want to remind people about the slides? Yeah. So uh, and also, so I, we have already uh, put all of the tutorial materials, including the slides and also the um, uh, the, the website uh, on the uh, right, uh, on the right corner of the barcode. So if you are interested in this uh, tutorial, you can scan this barcode. And also, if you have already, uh, you have already registered Huwa, you can check our agenda on Huwa, and the, the tutorial link is also provided there uh, on the on the all the things about our introduction about our uh, slides can be found uh, can be found on this uh, website. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 I think somebody just give me a minute. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, the problem is that they can hear from here, but then the remote presenter cannot be found from. And give it. Hello. Uh, hi. Yeah, maybe you can have a try to say something. Let Let us check the volume. Hello. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. This, this time is OK. The technician has OK. It. All right. But let's continue. Yeah, OK, let's continue. So. So first, let me introduce some background about this area, about the social manipulation and the, the misinformation mitigation. So in recent years, uh, the social manipulators are increasingly influencing the online public opinions through different kind of fake news and conspiracies and uh, like some other uh, uh, rumors, especially during the times of uncertainty. So this kind of uh, account, which usually coordinate together uh, including both uh, social bots and also some human operated trolls uh, uh, can collaborate together to increase the visibility of some specific narratives and conspiracies to intervene the public opinion online. So, for example, here we have uh, some examples uh, on the left uh, figure. We can see that during the uh, 2016 presidential election of the United States, uh, a very famous uh, organization called Internet Research Agency tried to control some social bots and also human-operated accounts to spread specific narratives on the internet and social media in order to change people's idea about different, you know, president president uh, candidates to influence the final results of the election. And also, the right figure are some uh, accounts suspended by Twitter officially uh, during the 2020 pandemic of COVID-19. So these uh, accounts try to share some very specific and common narratives about some uh, conspiracies and some fake news about the new pandemic. So most of these kind of accounts are controlled by some misinformation campaigns. Uh, with some specific uh, purpose in maybe politics, in maybe uh, public health. So, for example, during the presidential election of 2016 and 2020, the fake news widely spreading on uh, online social media platforms because a serious threat to the presidential election, such as the fake news about the election cheating during the 2000, uh, 2020 uh, election. Uh, and also, according to a study from George, uh, uh, George Washington University, there were more than 6.6 .6 million tweets linking to fake news and uh, also conspiracy news publishers during the 2016 election. 
And also during the pandemic of COVID-19, uh, a lot of rumors, conspiracies, and uh, some hate speech, like uh, some racism hate speech, are widely spread on social media platforms. For example, uh, the, the when the vaccine uh, when the vaccine of uh, COVID-19 is announced, uh, there are so many tweets uh, discussing about some uh, conspiracies. Like I believe you have ever heard about it. Like Bill Gates invented the COVID so that he can force people to get the vaccination, and he can put some you know things into the vaccination to control people's mind. That's very ridiculous. But unfortunately, a lot of people on social media really trust this kind of, you know, uh, fake news. So the, uh, let's look at the impact of the misinformation and the manipulation on public opinions and those uh, societal beliefs. So you can see on this uh, slide, uh, the widespread uh, fake news and social manipulation have led to significant change in how social media users perceive the reality and society. Uh, and this influenced both opinions and behaviors. So the left figure is presenting uh, troubling statistics about the beliefs of uh, conspiracies uh, 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 among the U.S. adults. So notably, a very significant percentage of people believe in those theories without any factual basis, such as the idea that the moon landing was faked or something like that. And turning to the... Uh, turning to, oh, sorry. It's, uh, and turning to the right, uh, right side, so we can see that um, uh, turns, uh, we, we can see a figure that uh, tells us the correlation between people's beliefs, uh, people's exposure to unreliable conspiracies, and uh, also the people's uh, vaccination ratio, and also the correlation between these two fixed factors and uh, the presidential e uh, and the election results. So basically, we can see that the blue spots here. Uh, you can see my mouse, right? So the blue spots here are all the states which vote to Joe Biden during the election. And we can see that in this kind of states, uh, the ratio of exposure to the conspiracy series is relatively low. And for those uh, uh, states where people generally vote to Donald Trump, the uh, exposure of some conspiracy uh, series and some fake news is relatively higher. And also we can see that in those states where the conspiracies are widely spread, the vaccine, uh, the vaccination ratio is relatively low, and in those states where the uh, this, <clears throat> where the conspiracies are not uh, very widely uh, spread, the vaccination ratio is relatively higher than those states that are uh, full of the uh, fake news and the conspiracies. So this data points show us the serious threat of uh, misinformation to people's behavior in both public health and also in. Uh, <clears throat> In, uh, in politics. So more, uh, more incorporated with some large language models and in-context learning, the manipulators of misinformation campaigns are bringing more serious rights. For example, they can have more powerful social votes for manipulation that can interact with users uh, like human, and thus they are much, much more to be detected because previous works on social body uh, detection heavily rely on the linguistic cues to distinguish bots from human. But since the larger model can simulate any linguistic style that we hope them to, we, we hope them to simulate uh, the and uh, the social manipulators can incorporate the social bots to behave more like human. And also, the social manipulators can use the larger language models to document more deceptive fake news. Uh, basically, they, uh, this is because the in-context learning can enable the larger language models to uh, simulate some specific narratives, for example, the narratives of mainstream uh, media. In this way, they can make their fake news looks more like the real news published by, you know, mainstream media like CNN, like uh, ABC, this kind of media. So in this way, it is harder for both people and the, mis uh, and the misinformation detection mo machine learning models to recognize such kind of fake news. And the third threat could be that the creation of multimodal misinformation is much easier. So this is an example, a famous uh, uh, 
journalists uh, just use a uh, uh, use a diffusion model, uh, AIGC model, to generate some fake images about Donald Trump get arrested. They are totally fake. But actually, for most of the people, they cannot recognize that they are faked images. And more importantly, when this news comes out at that day, it really influenced the stocking price of the United States. So to address these uh, aforementioned challenges, in this tutorial, we will introduce the research works in, in three topics that can contribute to the mitigation of misinformation and social manipulation in large language uh, model error. So the first uh, general uh, topic is about how to detect such kind of manipulations and uh, misinformation campaigns on social media. So we will first uh, introduce some uh, classical and representative works in the detection of social manipulators. And then we will discuss about how to uh, how the large language models can boost the performance of the, uh, the of the detections as well as influ uh, uh, influence further performance of the detection. And finally, we will introduce some um, collective detection models that are inspired by the uh, architecture of large language models that can help us to do not only supervised detection of social manipulators, but also unsupervised uh, detection of those anomaly uh, accounts. And uh, then for the second part, we will talk about how to use uh, machine learning models to understand the causal impact of misinformation. Uh, in other words, we hope to know that how misinformation influence people's behavior and activities. And uh, in this way, we can understand better that how we can intervene such kind of manipulation to mitigate the effect of them. So we will give some basic introduction to the causal inference and its application on social media. And then we will also uh, show some uh, show some uh, works that can help uh, that can incorporate the large language models to help us better understand the misinformation campaigns behaviors. And finally, we will talk about how we can boost uh, misinformation detection models with larger language models in this era. So we will talk about mainly two parts. Uh, so the first part will be the prompting and reasoning strategies that can help us better tackle the misinformation spread on social media. And the second one will be about how we can tackle the misinformation when we are trying to tackle the multimodal information. So uh, thank you so much. So let, let us first start this first topic. So uh, again, if you need the uh, tutorial materials, I will I already put the barcode at the right corner of the slide. So if you want to check it, you can just uh, take off your phone and scan it, and then you can see it. Also, it is posted on, on Hua, so you can also check it on our agenda. So the first topic that I hope to share with you will be the detection of the social manipulators. So in detection of the social manipulators, uh, we hope to identify and classify the social manipulators from, the, uh, from normal users. So in this kind of, this kind of task, uh, we define two kind of uh, counts uh, as labels. The first label will be normal, and the second label will be the manipulators. So, each, uh, so we hope to train a classification model that can take the features of the account to predict whether it is likely to be a normal account or like a social manipulators, like social bots. And here we present a, a, an example from a very famous inter, uh, uh, API of board or not. This is a very famous API that can help us to detect whether an account is a social bot or a normal user. So basically, we can see that this can uh, this this API uh, evaluates the accounts from multiple uh, perspectives and uh, output scores, and finally, assemble all of them to give people uh, the likelihood that it is a, a social manipulator or a human user. So to classify the uh, to classify the uh, manipulators, we need to <coughs> sorry abstract the, the account features to help the classifier to make the prediction. So basically, previous works have already summarized the, the following useful information that can help us to do the classification. The first kind of features are the metadata and the linguistic cues. So for example, here we can, uh, we can build up uh, some features like whether the, uh, 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 for example, some accounts that are created by after a specific date or one that frequently use certain keywords can be indicative of automated behaviors of, you know, social bots. And uh, 
Also, uh, the second kind of features are the structural features. So this kind of features are derived from the accounts social networks uh, of friends and also followers and also some interactions. So these features help us understand the social graph and the interaction patterns of these accounts. Uh, for instance, a, manu uh, a manipulative vote in the business domain might display unusual high um, the high numbers of followers or the strangely interconnected networks as shown in this diagram here. And the final uh, kind of uh, features will be the activity traces or pattern uh, traces uh, that are summarized in the time series information from the user's activities and events. So this kind of information allow us to directly analyze the behaviors over time. In this way, we can identify the both and uh, the manipulators is through some uh, uh, inconsistent, um, uh, incon uh, inconsistent patterns between human and users. For example, as humans, we usually just, uh, you know, uh, use the social media when we are not working, right? Like in our rest time, in maybe uh, in the evening or during the uh, lunch break. But w w of course, we may seldom use them in the work time. But for social manipulators, because their works will be manipulated the, the, uh, the online public opinions. So their working time will be uh, very uh, different from normal users. So let me first introduce about the classical features, which include the metadata and the uh, language. So to classify the individual uh, accounts, we need to put, uh, we need to construct uh, the account features to capture some uh, useful information. So the useful information are shown in this slide. We give you some figures that summarize the uh, wide range of basic information that can help us to classify them. Uh, for example, we can use uh, we, we can use the number of the followers. We can use the uh, statistic of some uh, uh, li uh, uh, statistic of the post that has already been posted by the account. And furthermore, we can use some more advanced uh, um, uh, statistic metrics such as the growing ratio of the following uh, following accounts. Uh, and also we can use some linguistic cues that are uh, acquired from the statistics of the word usage and also grammar errors. Uh, for example, here we posted some uh, examples like uh, the uh, like the, the, the use of some nouns, the use of some verbs, and also the problem uh, errors in the uh, ling language uh, in the language of the context. And finally, we can also use some uh, neural networks to encode the content as some representations, such as uh, RSTM. And in this way, we can represent the content that they post as some uh, hidden features so that we can forward them into the classifier. So in addition to the account's own features, it is also important to model their neighbor's features based on the graph structure of the social networks. So the most straightforward way to construct the social network will be to extract uh, to extract the following and friends relationships on the social graph. Like for example, if we see an account A and account B, they are friends, or account A is following account B, then we can connect them with an age, and in this way we can connect it. Uh, we can connect it different accounts and construct a large graph. However, this kind of uh, graph does not sufficiently give us the information uh, about the interaction and uh, like interest. For example, there might be some accounts that are not followers and they are not friends. However, they share some similar common interest into some specific things. Uh, so this will lead to some similar uh, Python activities between them. But because they are not friends and they are not following each other, so we cannot see such kind of ages and they're hidden behind the graph. So in order to tackle this issue, uh, some, uh, uh, some people propose that we should also construct a larger graph that not only inf uh, incorporates the information of relationships, but also some interactions. For example, in this kind of extended graphs, not only users can be the node in the in the graph, but also we can include some uh, posts, we can in some hashtags, we can include some communities as the node. And if some users are interacting with some tweets, like for example, they are retreating some tweet or they are uh, commenting some tweet, we can also link them with uh, with a link uh, with an edge. And in this way, we can 
dig out those um uh uh those covered uh, edges of shared interest, of shared opinions, of shared uh, uh, communities. So in this way, we can extend the knowledge in the uh, in the graph. So a typical strategy to make use of this kind of structural information for social manipulator detection is to first extract the classical features using our uh, using our previously uh, described uh, method. And then we can construct the graph where the uh, where the graph structures are constructed from the adjacency uh, matrix, and each account is attached with a feature of representation. And then we can do the we can use some graph neural networks or some other architectures to do the, the feature propagation on this uh, model. And then finally, we incorporate them to be a unified feature and use this unified feature. Uh, we can make the prediction. Uh, sorry. And so basically, the existing some benchmarking works have shown that the structure uh, inf features can significantly boost the performance of the classical features. Uh, here is a table that I cropped from a previously pa uh, paper. This paper is published on the NERIPS 20, 20, uh, 2024. So basically, they posted uh, the compare different kind of works. So the upper one, the, this, uh, sorry, let me show. So the upper one, all of these matters are with the uh, pure features and text, but they are not incorporating with the graphs. So on this kind of uh, features, the performance of the uh, models are generally worse on this data set. And uh, if we incorporate the models with some of the graph structure data, we can see a significantly boost of the performance in both accuracy and F1 score. So in addition to this kind of, you know, widely applied uh, classical features and the uh, structural features, recent advances in the deep learning time series analysis make it possible to directly learn patterns or features from the, uh, from the activity traces of the, account, uh, of the account data. So for example, we can use some temporal pattern features. This kind of method use some statistical learning or deep learning method to encode the time series as a features. Uh, the figure on the right show an example here. So basically, the authors of this paper try to use an auto train an auto encoder on the time series data to learn some useful representations that can encode the features in the time series. And then with this time series, they can do classification or they can also do some kind of uh, normalized detection to recognize those social manipulators. And in addition to the feature uh, uh, pattern learning matter, we can also try to learn the intentions of this uh, of the uh, account. And then by learning the intention, we can better classify them the, the social bot from users because for normal users, our intention are communicating with others, right? We are trying to learn from social media. We are trying to make friends. We are trying to make ourselves popular. But for social manipulators, they are different. They're uh, their uh, their motivation is to change people's idea. So we can uh, we can use inverse reinforcement learning to learn the rewards that drive different accounts activities. And in this way, by comparing the reward function of different kind of accounts, we can uh, we can better classify the social bot from the users. So here is an example. Uh, so we are given a, uh, we are given an account as an agent, and we have its action uh, action uh, tra tra trajectories, including states and uh, actions. Inverse reinforcement learning aims at learning a reward function that is a parameter with some personalized parameters and some shared parameters. For example, uh, the person uh, the shared parameters can be some encoder that encodes the uh, uh, environment, such kind of you know uh, uh, responses uh, like the contents to be a feature, and then the personalized parameters capture different users' different weight to different kind of features, and in this way we can learn diff uh, the difference between the accounts in the sense of uh, uh, the different weights to different kind of you know. Uh, interest, and in this way, we can compare the social bot and normal users and learn good classifier. So this, uh, 
Uh, so these are the uh, classical um, uh, methods that we can uh, apply to detect the, the social balls. So before we uh, go in, before we are going into the our uh, large language model based uh, social manipulation detection, do you have any questions uh, regarding to the aforementioned uh, uh, contents? Yeah. Hello, sir. Yes. Is it, is it Tom? Okay, so basically this uh it seems like a Because the microphone is a, a little bit problematic, I will first uh, rephrase uh, his uh, question. So basically, the question is that how to label the data, uh, the uh, how to decide whether an account is a social manipulator or it is um, a, a human user. So there are different. Uh, so the answer is that there are different ways to label this kind of data. So the old, uh, so basically previously the data uh, uh, people generally used the. Uh, uh, official conclusions from those social media platforms. Like for example, when people are crawling the data from tweets, the tweets officially get some uh, internal information that other people don't know. And based on this kind of information, such as uh, IP address, such as uh, some statistics, they will provide some labels that whether it is a, a social bot or it is a normal user. And also the recent uh, works are mainly using some uh, ways to and so voting ways to label whether it's a social bot or a human. So basically there we are recruiting some annotators, uh, uh, actually a lot of annotators. And this all these uh, annotators will learn some existing uh, existing data that distinguishing the uh, social manipulators from humans. And after that, they will say that, okay, this accounts move more like human and this account is more like a bot. And after that, they will vote uh, to uh, whether it is a social uh, social manipulator or a human user, and uh, finally they will apply the voting result as the final label for this uh, uh, data set annotation. Uh, did I make myself clear in this uh, question? Okay, thank you. So, do you have more questions? Uh, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me rephrase your question. So your question is that when we are trying to use this kind of features to classify the social manipulators from human, uh, how do we decide which kind of user to use to for, for the for the classification? Right? It, it, did I make? Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. So basically. Mm, you, so basically, you can always try to assemble all of them and learn the weight from different classifiers. Uh, basically, in the practical, um, in practical uh, scenario, the, the, the systems usually just, you know, train the uh, classifier and the detectors on different kind of features, and then they will use some assemble learning methodologies, try to automatically decide the weight of different users. Uh, you know, previously, they can use assemble and... Uh, well, frankly speaking, if you want to get some fancy things uh, to make your model look more fantastic, you can try to use some other neural architectures, like, for example, attention, right? You can use attention to dynamically uh, predict the, the weight of different uh, convolutions and then fuse them together. So this is one way. And uh, so this is the impractical scenario. And in general, uh, people, will, uh, people will decide it based on some sense of what kind of uh, uh, what kind of information are more critical for these targeted misinformation campaigns? Because as we illustrated in the introduction part, so the we uh, we are trying to detect those manipulators from some misinformation campaigns, and the different accounts from different you know misinformation campaigns they got different activity ways. 
So some accounts just try to manipulate your ideas with their own content. So in such a kind of uh, scenarios, you can always use uh, the text information will be more useful. And in some kind of scenarios, for example, they are not trying to post anything new. They are just, uh, you know, retweeting something to make you see them. So in such kind of scenario, uh, activities and also structural information will be more useful for the model to detect them. But of course, as I previously said, in thermal learning, always give you good performance in this, uh, not only in this test, but actually basically in most of the uh, applicable um, uh, machine learning uh, uh, scenarios, just try to ensemble them if you just want to improve your performance. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, oh, okay, so, sorry, your question? Okay, thank you. So well, I will try to rephrase your question because the microphone is with a lot of problems. Sorry for that. And so your question is that how should we distinguish the on-purpose social manipulators and just uh, some accidentally fake news spreaders, right? Okay, so that's a, that's a really nice question. So basically, uh, the social manipulators, they are spreading the misinformation on purpose. So, uh, or, or I should say that semantically or philosophically, they are doing the thing on purpose for some reasons, not uh, not for the normal reason that we use social media. Like we use, use social media to attract the friends, to make friends, to share opinions. We also try to change people's idea by sharing some comments, but it's more like that. That's just a part of our uh, life of you know entertainment, but. For the social manipulate, uh, so as human, we we may also you know spread some misinformation and fake news because sometimes we will, you know, we, we will got foolish, but we are not doing so for uh, work for everything. We are doing so simply because we are serving some other purposes. And social manipulators, they are usually controlled by some um, opinions or by some uh, uh, organizations like some kind of organizations like some company for people uh, for sorry for public relationship they will you, you know sometimes there are some companies they will try to you know spread some specific narratives not like uh, not uh, uh, exactly to fake news but also some true news but what they are trying to do is just for serving one purpose change people's idea for example there are some public uh, public relationship companies working for stars like uh, the actors, like the sports stars. And uh, they don't always spread misinformation. They will spread some true information, like which sports star is, you know, doing exercise again and he's trying hard to win the next uh, champion, but actually he's just uh, playing video games. So, I'm not talk so basically for this kind of companies, they just uh, post the, the things to change people's idea instead of really like uh, entertainment. So, and they will register some fake account. This kind of fake account, they don't have their own, you know, they are not real users. They are just trying to change people's idea by doing so. So, of course, all of these differences are more like the philosophy level. Uh, in the in practical level, so basically how we distinguish are, are, are like, uh, if, there is, uh, if it is not linked with some specific uh, organization, then we think that's just an accidental fake news spreader. If we found some evidences that it is linked to some coordinated campaigns or some uh, uh, organized organization, then we will define them as social manipulators. Do I make myself clear uh, on this question? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, hello, sir.
mentioned that money plays in the cost will be increasing to it for me. Yes. So, if it's clarified, I guess, from the perspective of the information itself, but I don't consider it. Oh, that's a nice question. So I will first rephrase your question. So the this gentleman's question is that uh, how we uh, do we need to distinguish the social manipulators using true information and the social inf manipulators using fake inf information? So that's really a nice question. So I will answer this question from two perspectives. From the annotation uh, uh, phase, in the annotation phase, when we are annotating the data, we usually don't distinguish them because we care about whether it is manipulating or not manipulating. People, human, also transfer you know, misinformation, but we are still human users. Social manipulators sometimes use true information, but they are still social manipulators. So when we are annotating the labels, we don't do such kind of distinguishment. But your uh, comments is definitely very, uh, with a lot of inspiration when we are trying to develop the future models to, because you know such kind of two accounts maybe have different activity patterns. So that's truly helpful when we are building the models in some specific uh, scenarios. Because you know, if you, for example, if you previously train a model that is on a, a data set where social manipulators mainly use fake news, maybe your model will focus more on those accounts you uh, spreading misinformation. But uh, if you then, uh, if then they change their policy, they change their strategy to use true information to manipulate people's idea, then maybe your model will fail. And so we have to do some balancing on this if when we are trying to focus on the model. That's a really nice question. Thank you so much, sir. So basically we have one more question and then we, have, I think maybe we must to, uh, go to the next uh, section for the, uh, for the interest of time. Do you have more questions on this topic? Oh, I see. Oh. Well, sorry. It's another, this is another presenter. We were working on the microphone. There are some issues of the microphone. It's bothering us for a long time. This is, yeah. Okay, so it seems like I have already answered all the questions. So let's now go to the next section about large language model boosted uh, social manipulator detection. Go through this. So, yeah. So the recent advances of large language models have already brought uh, both opportunities and the challenges to the social manipulator, mainly social bot detector. So the opportunities will be like the soda large language models like ChatGPT, like Air Llama. They can significantly boost the effectiveness of detection of social manipulators such as social bots. So this, uh, uh, this is because both classical features and those structural features can be easily organized as natural language data. And then we can forward this natural language data into the large language models for in-context learning. Like we can present them just a very few samples of social bots and, uh, uh, and human users and ask them to learn a few short learning classification between them. So such kind of paradigm is very important for the early detection of the social manipulators because uh, the previous models mainly require us to label a large data set. Like the data set I previously show you, the social ball on Twitter is about millions of accounts. Annotating that data, just annotating that data is sufficiently to be published on your lips. So you will understand how much workload it will incorporate to do. But if they suddenly shift their strategy, like just uh, I just uh, uh, answered the, the gentleman's uh, th that gentleman's question. If they suddenly change their strategy from using fake news to using or selecting specific true news, how do we update the model? It will be very hard. But for larger models, they are fantastic in future learning. I, I believe most of you have ever tried to you know give them a, 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 an example text and say that hey, please generate some other text. Uh, 
with the style within this uh, text. And then you will see that, oh, it, with just maybe one document, it can sufficiently learn the style. So it so for uh, the similar thing is happening for the uh, social manipulator detection. When those manipulators change their behaviors or their strategies, you just need to detect one or two accounts as the context for the in-context learning, and then you forward them to the large language model. The large language model can help you to annotate the rest of the models, and then you can just do some uh, human verification or some human filtering to construct the very large data for the further detection model uh, training. So this is the advantage that is brought by the large language model. But it also brings some challenges. This is because that, you know, most of the large language models, they are either uh, open sourced or providing services to everybody, which means that not only we, the justice guys, can use the large language model to do the detection, but also those bad guys, those social manipulators, can use the large language models to improve the, uh, the, the, the ability of their social manipulators in deceiving people and deceiving the system. And in this way, they can help the, uh, the they can make the, the, the social manipulators harder to be detected. And I will show you some examples there. So first, I will talk about the opportunities in the manipulator detection via large language models. So we can easily convert the classical uh, metadata and also the, you see my mouse, right? The classical uh, metadata and also text information and the structural information of the context so, and then we can uh, we can uh, we can adapt the model on this test via two kind of ways. The first kind of way is to do the in content learning, which is that we provide some examples to the model, and then we say that hey, please based on this uh, this very few examples, please help me to classify the query samples. And the second kind of way can be the instructional tuning which is like we can just fine tune the model on a small fraction of labeled data set. Uh, and then with the fun uh, instructional tuning, we can uh, update the parameters of the large language model and make it give, give, uh, give us better predictions. So uh, here, is a, it, here is a result from a paper discussing about these uh, uh, this, uh, directions. So here, uh, also this, Original table is very large, so I crop some of them. So what I'm trying to express here is that the bot detection of the ChatGPT is actually quite well with only very few, uh, very few examples. Like you can see that the method here, they are all trained on a big data set with a lot of training samples with label. But here, the bot detection with ChatGPT, only ChatGPT, no uh, fine tuning. They're just to use very few samples, maybe. Uh, four to five samples, and then they can achieve relatively good performance in the accuracy, even defeating some uh, well-trained model, uh, uh, models that are well-trained on a big data set. And if we allow the ChatGPT to do instructional tuning on the labeled data set, then the performance of the uh, bot detection models with ChatGPT can successfully uh, defeat the performance of the uh, existing works on both the uh, old data set, the 20, it means the 2020 version, and this 2022, this is, the, this is actually the paper published on the 2024, but it's uh, from the data uh, in the 2022. You can see that they need about two years to label such kind of data set. So, but unfortunately, every coin has its two sets. So manipulators can also use similar way to convert the larger models as their assistant. Specifically, they can have two strategies. So the first strategy is that they can use the larger language model to manipulate the text content so that it is, will be harder for us to extract the text features that we can use to detect the social bots. <coughs> And the second way is that they can use the large language models to help them manipulate the structure of the manipulators. They can ask the, so you can see the uh, examples on the right side. So for text manipulation, it is very easy. You can just ask it, hey, ChatGPT, please help me to convert this text more like human language. Then it can do so. But for structural uh, manipulation, they can also give some examples of the prediction from the detection models, and then tell the ChatGPT, hey, 
please give me some suggestion that how I can change my structure information to make my bot look more like human. And then the ChatGPT can give you some suggestions on how to change the structure. Like uh, you can unfollow this guy and follow that guy. And in this way, you can make the model feels like uh, you are uh, more like a human bot. It's more like using uh, ChatGPT to do some adversarial attack to the structural uh, prediction models. So the other uh, evaluated the large language models in, in, in manipulating the classical models and also the large language model boosted detectors. So basically, for classical detectors, large language model based manipulations is highly deceptive. So you can see them, uh, uh, see, see this part. So these two columns are the classical models with uh, structured data and the text data. And uh, so you can see that uh, the vanilla version on this uh, Twitter board will be the 75% uh, accuracy. And if we, if we use the uh, LLAMA to do the rewrite and to do the uh, manipulation of the structure, we can su successfully uh, reduce accuracy from 75% to 65%. That is very serious because you know for the, uh, for the uh, for the large uh, for, for this is a binary classification problem, right? So basically, if fifty percent mean that you are as random as flipping a coin, and but for large language large language model based detectors, the manipulations from another language model will be more effective than the manipulation from itself. Like for example, if the the detector is based on ChatGPT, and I use the ChatGPT to manipulate it. Okay, it will not work. But if we are using ChatGPT as a detection model and we ask El Lama to manipulate the data, then it can help us to deceive the, the, the models. So here are, are the columns. Uh, uh, are the columns. So sorry, I need to be a little bit faster. So yes. So here are some roadmaps or some outlooks that what we can do for the future. So address the new challenges from larger models, we can attempt the following directions of research effort. So the first thing is that we can try to develop some detectors towards the AI manipulated content. Uh, this, uh, the experiment result from this paper, the previous, uh, the previous paper uh, have shown that the larger model based detectors are robust to the manipulation from their own backbone. This suggests that the, if we can uh, develop, uh, we can develop some more powerful recognizer that can recognize which uh, uh, larger model the, the bad guys are using, then we can use the corresponding detectors to mitigate their manipulation. So the question or the challenge or I can say the chance here is that how should we recognize the large language model that is used by the manipulator? This will be very helpful when tackling the manipulation. And also the second thing is that we can try to aggregate the activity features into the detector. Because as I just say that they use structural information and they use text information. But both of these two kind of information are quite indirect for distinguishing social bots and human. More importantly, they actually behave much differently in the activity patterns. So if we can incorporate the model detectors with such kind of information, maybe we can help the model to detect them better, like distinguishing the intention rather than distinguishing the patterns. But the problem is that how should we incorporate the large language models with the time series feature? So there are some papers that I, I don't have enough place to put all of the citations here, but I do give you the name of the paper so that you can check them uh, as I said, all of them. So basically there are different kind of ways to incorporate the large language models with the time series data. Like you can fine tune the whole model. Also, you can just fine tune the embedding layers to let them to be able to tackle the time series, to be more sensitive to the time series. And also you can try to convert the time series to some formats that are compatible to the large language models or the large multiple dial model. For example, I know a very clever paper, which is that they have an activity traces, right? They convert the activity traces to be an image. Let's like they use the uh, Python plot to plot it as an image. And then, you know, ChatGPT4 can use region data. They just forward the image 
together with the uh, uh, text into the uh, into the machine learning model, and they found that the performance is boosted. But of course, I believe there will be there will be some more beautiful way to use it rather than just convert it to be a, a image data. And so uh, we had we just finished this uh, section. So do you have uh, before going into the next uh, section? Do you have okay? Yeah, sir. Your question is. Uh, 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 um, I, I will first rephrase your question, but I didn't quite get this question. So you mean that social bots can deceive the recommendation system, right? If, uh, because of the strategy, uh, they can uh, use the yes. in order to uh, the detection. So, if this observes the detection, that's a good question. So, for now, there are not, you know, uh, very this this uh, you know very solid evidence that uh, uh, there are such kind of accounts to do the structure manipulation. There are definitely a lot of manipulation with the uh, text, but there are definitely, uh, uh, and, but for the structural manipulation, the paper here is, uh, is uh, presenting a probability that we can use it to do so. And because we can do it, use it to do so, the bad guys can do the same thing. And so before they become clever enough to use this kind of strategy, we must be prepared to it. So that is more like the, the, the intention of that paper. Uh, as for the practical uh, observation, for now, there are not very solid evidence that uh, there are you know, <clears throat> uh, such kind of application because, because you know, this is hard to be uh, detected from researcher side. Only the social media platform have the full data, right? And uh, so also because you know, only the open AI know that who are prompting the chat GPT to do this task. So we ask some outside guys, we cannot say about it, but we're just saying that there are evidences strongly suggest that this thing is doable. As long as this thing is doable, we need to be prepared to address the challenges behind, uh, brought by it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, please, sir, I saw, I saw you raise the hand first there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you So it seems that being on this question. For this to succeed, the others reason to circumvent the social media platform to bring into the data. Because without being able to bring into the data and modify the features, um, it is not possible. Ooh. Does that make sense? So for this, for lack of the model um, to be used by manipulators, you need like a new access to the social media platform. Oh, I, I got your point. So, so his question is that uh, is uh, is it possible to protect uh, to uh, to uh, to stop the manipulation by changing the features and the statistic uh, metrics that are uh, uh, distributed by the social media platforms, so that the manipulators don't know. How to change? Uh, how their intervention will change the the results of the detection, right? Okay, that's a really nice question. So I think that uh, that definitely could be some uh, very interesting direction that you can maybe write a position paper or some claims to call for such kind of attention to the from the uh, social media platforms 
to see that uh, uh, to 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 stop you know distributing all the metrics that uh, they are uh, uh, that they are posting to people and uh, uh, also I think that this will be very use uh, but still there are some issues which is that even if they cannot see those uh, those manipulators cannot see those specific metrics they can still do some you know a b test like they have some accounts a and accounts b to groups and they use different uh, strategies and to observe how many rates uh, the rates of different groups of being banned because after all the social media platform have to do something as, as long as you do something it is possible to make people know something so but all uh, Definitely, your suggestion will be very useful uh, in a certain sense to stopping the uh, to stop the manipulation. Yeah, that's yeah. Yes. Based on what? Oh, yeah. So so. Uh, yeah, of course, it's a bit on the features, but still, you know, they can, they can even if the social media do not post it, they can still use some API to calculate them by themselves. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, they can, they can, Ask the larger model to give them suggestions to help them to, you know, evade from the detection. Yeah, we we have the last chance for uh, for this section. Yeah. Please, sir. Yeah. 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 Yes. The first question is that I really wonder what is the reason why manipulation from another algorithm is more effective than manipulation from higher or other things. And based on this question, another question is that uh, uh, I noticed that um, in currently we have more and more open source algorithms published, and the manipulators can train their own, or they train their own anonymous algorithms for, for malicious attacks. So. But uh, if the LLM's identity is not available online, so how can we um, identify their, uh, their language style and to publicly to make uh, uh, events about them? Yeah, thank you, sir. Your question is really, really uh, valuable. And uh, not valuable, valueless. So, um, so, uh, uh, so basically, your uh, I will rephrase the, this gentleman's question. So, this uh, the the question is that. Uh, we previously mentioned that the uh, the deception from another language model other than the detector will be more effective. So first, uh, what is the reason behind it? And secondly, there are a lot of open uh, sources, uh, large language models. So if they train their, train their own models, how should we uh, get rid of it? So let me first uh, explain the first question. For now, because this paper is just a uh, Reported and the, because I'm introducing some very advanced uh, papers recently published. So basically, they are not very solid uh, conclusion about why this will happen. But we can, uh, I, based, uh, there are a lot of papers dis, uh, discussing about large language model uh, generated text detection. Like they want to detect whether a language, is, uh, a content of language is generated by the large language model or generated by human, you know, to for example, fat cheating, right? So uh, they found that actually for larger models to the text that they generated by themselves, the publicity will be low because it is generated by its own self. So it knows that it is generated by itself because the, 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 the human gets our own wording, like habits, like... Yeah, yes, yes. Because the larger model for its own output, it will it can it can recognize its own output because the probability of its own generated text will be lower, or in other words, the likelihood will be higher. So it can see that. So actually, this is a quite common 
a way to recognize the large language model generated text uh, recently. And so this is actually a very uh, important thing about why it can factor that it can find out those uh, manipulation. And the second thing is, uh, so that's why if you are manipulating ChatGPT with ChatGPT, ChatGPT know that you are manipulated. So it can just remove the things. And the second issue is, uh, and the second question is uh, like, uh, so we, what if they train their own models? So I think we should discuss it from two sides. If they train the model from scratch, they, uh, they, they, they train their own large language model from scratch with their own data, I, frankly speaking, I cannot currently come up with some good way to tackle it. And it will be a very, you know, important direction to explore so that you can, you know, publish some uh, important opinions about them. Uh, but for the second case, the second case is like you, you got some base model and you fine tune them, right? For, for example, you fine tune an Lama. In such case, I noticed some papers from the, the larger model content detection, and they found that even for this kind of cases, you can easily recognize uh, which base model they are using. You fine tune it. Yeah, you, you do some fine instruction fine tuning. <clears throat> like from, um, you can still know that the, the code is uh, some waterproof of, uh, no, the water print of large language model, and it is published on the ACLIR 2024. I forgot the name of the paper, but you, you can check it. So basically, they say that if you're fine tuning, a lot of things are still pre preserved. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, let's go to the next section so that we can. Uh, so we are uh, for the next uh, section. We are going to talk about some collective detection of the manipulator co campaigns inspired by large language model. So I use inspired because it's not directly using the ChatGPT or the LLAMA directly, but it's using some similar way. So first, uh, before we go into the model details, let's first define the task. So here we aim at de detecting some malicious accounts collaborating on social media to expand the influence in an unsupervised manner. So previously, we are trying to you know, label them, bots or normal users, and do the classification with some features. Now we are doing something different. We are acquire a, a, a lot of accounts, and maybe, for example, 10,000. And we know some of them are anomalies, and some of them are normal guys. The question is then, how do we recognize those anomaly or collectively anomaly groups based on the features in an unsupervised or semi-supervised uh, learning manner. So existing works mainly rely on the domain knowledge to construct some interaction graph. And then on this graph, they can do clustering and they can find some really anomalously uh, concentrated groups. And this kind of small groups are more likely to be the anomalized group that are manipulating the content. Uh, like, for example, a typical strategy is to evaluate the user's activity with overlap. So we define that, the, uh, so we define that two events from two users are equivalent uh, if their uh, activity tab, the CI here, are the same, the activity category are the same, and the time gap between these two events are uh, less than a, a, a constant that we set as a hyperparameter. Hyper, uh, hyper and if it satisfies, satisfies such kind of uh, constraint, we say that, okay, these two events are equivalent. And then we can compute the similarity of two users uh, by computing the Jacquard similarity between their activity set. However, uh, and then you can get the similarity score of them. You can do the graph uh, clustering to find those anomaly groups. But for this kind of method, they generally suffer from very poor expressive power because you're just a, you know, using some manually designed features which are now learned from data. And also it relies on the quality of your prior knowledge and then your prior knowledge rely on their activity strategies, which means that again, if they change their strategies, previous model fail, prior knowledge fail. So in order to tackle the, in order to tackle this issue, we propose. Okay, so I'm introducing our own papers now. Uh, the, 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 we introduce a way that instead of you know you constructing a graph with some uh, prior knowledge, we can use some representation learning model, 
directly learn some representations for the users from the observed activity tracing. And then in this representation space, you can always do anything you want. Classification, uh, semi-supervised learning, unsupervised clustering, anything you want. And the representation is learned from the data so that no matter how they change their strategies, as long as you can accumulate enough data, such kind of patterns can always be uh, learned out by the representation learning model. So why do we say that, <coughs> sorry, why do we say that it is a uh, large language model is bad representation learning? So here is a very, I think it's a very smart uh, 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 observation to the model. So we noticed the similarity between the next token prediction large language model modeling and the activity traces. Because, for example, the traces here, you can see my mouse, right? The traces here are like the user and time, user two and time two, user three and time three, such kind of sequences, right, for a post. Like you, you have a tweet, you can organize all of the uh, users which inter interacted with it as a list and uh, listing their uh, interacting time. And the, the uh, probability of this whole sequence can be formalized as you first observe the first event and the conditioning on the first event predicts the next uh, event. Conditioning on the first two events predicting the third event. And you can multiply all of them together. So you see, modeling the sequence, uh, the activities here is exactly the same as the next token prediction of the large language model. So this means that we can use some similar structure to capture, to learn the representation. So basically what we can say is that the tokens, uh, the users here, the user ID here, is that correspond to the tokens or the words in the large language model. And the time here corresponds to the positional encoding in the large language model. So we can use similar way. Like you can see that we, we propose a attentive mixture distribution network. So it's a first get an encoder. It is a causal mask self attention encoder, which is very similar as the uh, you know the larger models. And uh, they will help us to capture the influence from the previous token or previous events to the next token. And uh, with the history encoding, we can predict the next user and the time. For the user prediction, we can just follow the larger model to pick up from the vocabulary. The vocabulary here is exactly the user vocabulary corresponding to the word uh, vocabulary in the large language model. And for the time, or for the positional encoding, we can use a uh, Gaussian mixture distribution decoder to uh, predict the time, because the time must be a continuous distribution, right? So we can use a Gaussian mixture to model it. And uh, as previous works uh, proved, uh, this kind of, uh, it's a little bit small here, you cannot see that, right? So basically, you, you can check the slides. We, uh, you can see the, the, in this paper, the authors prove that this kind of Gaussian mixture decoding method can approximate any distribution of time in, in, continu in continuous range. And, and jointly, we can, uh, simultaneously, we can jointly learn the membership of those accounts based on a, a clustering model, like a, 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 like a Gaussian mixture model in the user embedding space, or let's just say the token embedding space. So in this way, we can automatically learn their membership to different groups. And by doing the statistics to different groups, we can recognize those social manipulator groups and the, um, so the, and the normal groups. So here are the results of the uh, large round model inspired representation learning. So here we can see that the proposed model generally outperform all the baseline model in both unsupervised sighting and in supervised sighting. And also we do some analysis to the attention weight. And this kind of analysis reveals that the interaction action between the coordinated accounts, which correspond to the blue plot, decreases faster than the normal user. This, this shows that usually for normal users, our interaction are based on something like interest, like friendship. So we don't change it uh, a lot as time goes by. But for, uh, for those uh, social manipulators, because they are targeting on the hotspot events, so their behaviors, their interactions can change faster uh, along with the time. And also, we can further boost the representation learning with the prior knowledge we just uh, we just talked about. So basically, uh, the prior knowledge suffers from the poor expressive power. 
And for the representation learning, we don't suffer from this issue, but they rely on the quality and the quantity of the data. However, we know that for uh, social media data, basically the user appearance follow the, uh, follow the po uh, po uh, follow the power's law, right? So basically there's a long tail distribution. Uh, maybe 80% uh, of the appearance are occupied by 20% of the users. So in such a case, some users may have not enough data for us to learn the representations. In such a case, we hope that we can boost those kind of accounts with our prior knowledge. So we propose that we can further uh, use the uh, account representation as supplement to the menu features and then use the menu features, use those uh, prior knowledge to regularize the learning of the representation. So here is uh, another model that we propose to tackle this issue. So basically this model is an EM algorithm uh, with the learning with the knowledge. So we jointly uh, learn the knowledge and the the data-driven representation. So this EM algorithm incorporated two steps, the E step and the M step. In the E step, we will first use the data-driven representation to give some uh, initial prediction on the user's account. And then we will use the knowledge-based graph to enhance this uh, prediction. And this enhanced prediction is as Q. And after that, we go back to use this Q as some uh, pseudo labels to up further update the uh, data-driven model. And then in this way, we form, uh, form a loop. And after conducting this loop for one or two iterations, the, model of the, uh, the performance of the model can be further boosted. So here is an experiment result. So you can see that we build our model on the top of the previous model called AMDNH. And you can see that in general, with different kind of, uh, the TL and PF here mean different kind of uh, prior knowledge. So basically, both of these two kind of knowledges can help the model to get boosted performance in the social manipulator rate recognition. And we further do some analysis on a COVID-19 based data set. Uh, on this data set, because uh, it's without the ground truth labels, uh, so we can only do some statistics to them. But still, we found that the, this proposal model detects some anomaly uh, groups from the, uh, from the normal groups. And we can see that their hashtags are very different. So the two groups are clearly distinguished in the comparison of top 30 hashtags. Uh, so for example, for the normal group, they, been, they mainly just uh, focus on some normal things like uh, the, 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 the policies and what will happen. But the social manipulators definitely, oh, sorry, definitely pay more attention to the, uh, uh, to the hashtags about politics, about elections to something like, you can, you can see here, like uh, one hashtag here is the uh, Trudeau uh, failed. It's, uh, you know Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada. So basically it's saying that uh, Trudeau is going to fail something like that. And there are also some other things about Australia uh, politics and other uh, countries politics, uh, but they're ignored here because we only selected the top 30 uh, hashtags. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So that is uh, that the end of the first uh, section about um, social manipulator detection. Uh, do you have any question about this? Uh, yes, sir, please. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's that's a great question. That's a great question. So I will rephrase it again because because of the microphone issue, I will find the technician to fix it uh, during the coffee break. So basically, uh, this gentleman asked us a question that uh, how explainable the previous models can be because you know if the model is not explained uh, because the, the the platforms need to use the prediction results to do some intervention like for example restricting some accounts access to the to the to the social media platform and to uh, to do such kind of decision they must do do it in an explainable way to support their decision right and so whether uh, so this gentleman's question is that whether we, we, these um, models are explainable enough to support such kind of decisions right 
Okay, so first, these kind of models are um, based on statistical learning. And we always know that for statistical learning, we cannot achieve 100% accuracy. That's why you can refer to this um, uh, as a social media platform. They can refer to this detection as some filtering strategy. Like they can filter out those accounts that they need to, you know, verify. But they cannot use them directly as the final uh, evidence to, to follow. Right. And this is the first thing. And second thing is that even though it cannot totally, exactly, totally work the full pipeline, it can still provide some useful uh, evidences. First, you see here that we use some prior knowledge, right? So this kind of prior knowledge are usually very um, explainable. Like they say that, okay, your similar are too extremely similar, much over than normal users' uh, consistency, right? And then we can say that that's an evidence. And because we are constrained with such kind of human knowledge, we can use the detective human knowledge as some support to the decision. And also we can go back to, oh sorry, we can go back, yeah. You see this analysis to the attention weight, right? So based on the attention weight, we can also use uh, some score measuring the consistency of or the correlation between two accounts. And if this metric is too high, we can always say, okay, that's uh, some evidence suggesting that you are anomalously consistent in activity patterns. But of still, as statistical learning model, this kind of um, uh, model uh, decision cannot be totally regarded as the final decision. The social platform, uh, social media platforms have the responsibility to finally do the verification based on their own, you know, detection systems or their own knowledge. So, but still this model can help them to accelerate this process by filtering out those important uh, accounts that they need to verify. Uh, do I make myself clear? Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Pardon? The, do, do you my work to operate one? Uh, so, sorry, I just... Yes. Well, I tried to... Uh, mm, uh, so for now, I didn't get a chance to really collaborate with them. Actually, previously, I... Previously, I, I used to have a chance to, you know, do an internship in Twitter, but uh, then it because Twitter is bought by a guy who laid off most of the the, the staff, so by the 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 guy who ha tried to hire me is also fired. So I lost this chance to do the internship, and unfortunately, they didn't get a chance to use my model. That's a big strategy. But still, yeah, I will try to, you know. Makes the, uh, also, I'm hosting the tutorial here to you know, expand the influence and to try to make people realize this issue, and so that they can use some not not exactly not necessarily to be my model, but try to you know pay attention to this and do some further works on it. Yeah. 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 You you mean this? You mean uh, I need to do some clarification. So I previously discussed two things: the social manipulator detection and this collective detection, right? So we are using different data sets. The previous data set are more focusing on the social bots because social bots are are uh, you know more generally well exist. But for this uh, detection of those misinformation campaigns, so because we are trying to, so there are differences like for the. So the previous one, our classification, we are just uh, predicting the label. For this one, we need to predict which group, the group membership of them. And uh, to tackle this issue, uh, the data set we use are from um, uh, are from the previous work. In this work, the annotations are from Twitter officially. So they officially annotate those human operated accounts on a topic about presidential election. And their annotation, uh, according to my, uh, according to my understanding, to their uh, 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 to, to their announcement, is that their uh, annotation is based on the investigation results from U.S. Congress, because that group of uh, organization is from Russia, and they are trying to manipulate the presidential election, which 
make the U.S. Congress try to try to invest them and get some conclusions. And then based on the conclusions, the Twitter officially annotated those accounts, uh, 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 accounts uh, uh, identities, and then we can so that we can use them to evaluate our model. Uh, that's also why for some data set like this uh, COVID nineteen data set, we cannot have labels because the Congress didn't do such kind of in, uh, do to do such an inspection, so we don't have the ground truth labels. Yeah, I see. Okay, so I think maybe we can. Oh, this is perfect time controlling. It's ten thirty, and I think the coffee break has already start. So I think maybe we can have a break here. And uh, about 30 minutes uh, later, we will go back to uh, to uh, continue our uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So I think maybe I can start from um, let's discuss the uh, part of the uh, about the misinformation on social media, which is the causal influence of the misinformation on social media. So before going into the details, I will still show that the, all, all of our tutorial materials will be um, <clears throat> uh, be put in the link uh, associated with the barcode on the right corner. So if you are interested, you can check it. Also, it can be found on Hua. So let's start. Well, before going into the details, I know that for the community of uh, the web conference, the uh, called the inference may not be a very, very uh, popular topic. So I will give some basic introduction to causal inference. So the causal inference aims at understanding the causal relationship between a treatment and an outcome. For example, the cause could be smoking and the result could be lung cancer. And the golden standard of, yeah, I'm not muted. So the golden standard of measuring ground truth causal effect is random controlled uh, trials called as RCT. So in the scope of social media, the most well-known RCT is the uh, A-B test. Like here is an example the, on the right, right side. So basically we can randomly align the user to be two groups, A group and B group. For A group, we use our uh, baseline uh, recommendation system. For the uh, for the B group, we give them some newly developed uh, uh, recommendation systems. And uh, after that, we um, we can um, uh, evaluate the performance difference between them. This is the golden truth to understand the causal in, uh, the causal relationship between changing the recommendation system to the, uh, uh, the, the the effect or to the performance of your uh, like the KDI, like the click stream, uh, click, uh, click rate, yeah. However, random controlled trials are generally not very applicable in many cases due to the following reasons. So the first re issue is that it is with very high cost because conducting random controlled trials usually requires a lot of resources. Like you have to uh, recruit some subject, so recruit some people to do the uh, trial. So this lead to very high cost. Second issue is that the limited uh, data quantity, because this is some um, direct result of the high cost. Because your cost is high, so you cannot accumulate enough data, and your data quantity is usually very limited. And the third issue is the ethical uh, ethical concern when tackling societal problems. RCT some often requires us to recruit human subjects, which may lead to ethical concerns. For example, if you want to know the impact of misinformation, sometimes you may have to, if you want to do the RCT, random controlled trial to evaluate the impact of misinformation, you may have to expose those recruited people to misinformation on purpose. This is with very strong ethical concerns. So that is something that we don't want to do. To tackle the dis disadvantages of uh, random controlled trials, uh, causal inference is developed to, uh, to, uh, to uh, causal inference from observation is developed to tackle this issue. So instead of actively conducting trials, causal inference aims at understanding causal effect from the data that are passively collected through the, something like API, uh, like API, or from some observation or some uh, uh, research projects. However, an emerging challenge arises in this area is that there are some confounders. So, the, what is the confounders? So, the key factor 
of random controlled trials is that the assignment of the treatment must be randomized. But confounders may influence the treatment assignment. Uh, ignoring such influence will lead to some biased estimation. For example, here I will give a, a, an example from the daily life. Like we got some patient's data. Okay, so for different patients, they got the two kinds of treatment, staying in normal uh, hospital or go to SEU. So this is a treatment. So in passively collected data, we can observe that usually the patients with more serious conditions will be more likely to be assigned to SEU, right? And thus their death rate will be higher. If you ignore the confounders, just to say that, okay, we just uh, directly co compute the correlation between going into SEU and uh, that, you will see that they're positively correlated, which means uh, that you will draw a conclusion that going into SEU make patients die. That's definitely wrong because for they are put into SEU because they originally got very severe conditions. So they get into the SEU. And uh, but, but directly computing the correlation between the treatment and the outcome cannot show such kind of effect from the confounders. Therefore, it gives us bias estimation. And to really understand the causal effect of, me, of, of any treatment, we must exclude this kind of uh, effect from confounders. This is the key point or the key uh, research problems that people are trying to solve in the um, uh, causal inference area. So basically the idea is to combat this confounder is that because the in RCT, we hope the things to assignment to, of treatment to be randomized. So our way uh, to do it in causal inference is that we try to do some balancing to the, to the data or to the model so that they can exclude the effect from the confounders. And uh, so there are basically two kind of ways. First kind of this is to do the data reweighting or sampling. So basically this strategy is trying to uh, change the data distribution, like uh, resample more on this data with uh, less treatment uh, uh, assignment so that we can make them balanced and look like uh, RCT data. And the second way is to use balanced representation learning. This kind of strategy aims at learning a neural network that can, uh, that can project uh, the covariates and the confounders and basically everything into a representation space where the correlation between treatment and confounders are mitigated so that they can ensure that uh, given the confounders uh, uh, representation, uh, we don't predict uh, treatment better than we just uh, use as a prior distribution. So here the H is the neural encoder. So this is the basic uh, idea in causal inference. So now we are going to uh, into uh, going to introduce some basic application of uh, causal inference in social media. So in social media, the main confounders that we have to tackle are actually from the user's activity and recommendation systems, because. Ideally, if we want to estimate some causal effect, we hope that the exposure to some specific information to be you know, uh, unbiased. Like if the probability that I'm exposed to misinformation is 50%, then someone else should be also be 50%. And under this kind of constraint, we can estimate the causal effect. But the problem is that the recommendation system will estimate your interest in specific contents. And then it will change the distribution that different people get exposed to different information. Uh, this is because the modern social media platform commonly apply the personalized uh, uh, recommendation system. And this will lead to something like, we all know that information coupons, right? You're always, you are always recommended with those content that you are likely to click. And as a result, different people get different kind of exposure. In such a case, if you directly estimate that uh, different group of people have different kind of tendencies that you may get some very biased estimation. So the causal inference help us understand how misinformation and manipulators can causally uh, uh, affect the online users' activities by mitigating the co confounders' uh, effect. So the common applications including the mainly two scenarios. 
for the first scenario is going to be the one that I'm going to introduce, which is like uh, we can use causal inference to know the causal relationship between a user's attribute to its susceptibility to fake news. And uh, this will be some uh, previous uh, works that I'm going to introduce. And I believe you, uh, 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 I believe you are still not very late for that. Yeah. And the second scenario is that uh, given the uh, exposure to a tweet, can we know how it will in influence people's uh, idea and future activities? So this will be something that we can and estimate incorporated with the help of like large language models. So let's first go to into the first application. So in social media analysis, we hope to learn the user's susceptibility to misinformation. However, in codal, in this causal relationship, user's activity patterns work as a confounder because different different kind of activities influence the recommendation system strategy. And so they recommend people with different content. And to exclude this kind of challenge, this paper proposed propose a causal model to uh, mitigate the effects of the, of the confounders of the recommendation systems based on uh, the data redistribution, uh, data revating. So the authors introduced two binary variables in their papers. So one is interestingness and one is exposureness. The interestingness means that whether the user is interested in the uh, misinformation or susceptible to the misinformation or not. And the other one, the exposure means that whether the recommendation system recommended the user or not. So we cannot directly observe these two variables. What we can observe is their product in this line one. Because all we know are like whether this guy responds to it or did not respond to it. But we don't know whether, uh, we don't know whether a guy who didn't interact with the misinformation has ever been exposed to it or not. So this is the difficulty in estimating the causal effect. So in this work, what they do is, in the ideal scenario, like a random control trial, the RUI here, the, the, exposure, uh, no, the exposure here should be independent to the, uh, no, the interest here should be independent to the exposure. Therefore, we can have this formulation. It's a very long equation. If you are interested, you can check our original slide, how to accelerate. But because of the modern recommendation system, they can predict whether you are interested or not. So as a result, the P of the, uh, the distribution of the interestness and the exposures may not be balanced. And so the authors apply the inverse uh, propensity uh, scoring to reweight the sample involved in the final loss function. And uh, in this way, they can, uh, they can decrease the score of those overexposure uh, cases and increase the weight of those less exposure cases. And in this way, they balance the data. And on this balance, the data, uh, they balance the loss function. And in other words, they are balancing the data. And uh, the, in this way, they can learn a balanced model that can correctly estimate the um, uh, the uh, the susceptibility of the user to the uh, to the uh, to to the information, yeah. So basically, here are the results, and this is uh, this you, you can see that uh, if you balance them, you always get a good performance. Yeah. So this is the application of the classical uh, causal inference of social media. And now we are going to introduce more work, which is also my own work. Yeah, so about how to integrate uh, large language models into the causal inference uh, in the social media. So in this case, we are going to discuss a more complicated case where that the, the covariance of the users, which means the history uh, activities of the user, will influence the confounder and finally influence the treatment. And in this way, you, the, treat, the confounder's treatment uh, outcome, they're all correlated. And it is hard to distinguish the causal effect of treatment toward the outcome. So the mm, uh, and so, uh, but we have to know such kind of causal influence uh, uh, from misinformation because the misinformation campaigns are operating those uh, <coughs> public opinions on the hot topic, uh, hot topics. And in order to design the mitigation strategy to reduce user susceptibility, we need to understand how misinformation influence users' beliefs and activities. But still, let's go back to this, this, this pictures, this kind of you know uh, uh, relationship. 
the existing causal inference mainly tackle the confounders of indicator variable. Like the case we showed just now, the classical one, they, they use the zero one variable to indicate whether the model um, do the recommendation or not. But this is like an indicator or like a scala. Mm, so for scala and indicator, because they are, or, or they are more like um, uh, discrete uh, distribution. So it is always very, always very easy to compute this conditional distribution of treatment under the confounder. And you can always, you know, uh, revise the models with this computed out uh, results. But for social media data, the confounders are, in social media data, the confounders are from hidden behind the user's history activities, which are the sequences of the events, like we, uh, we, we presented in the first section. And uh, this kind of events are attached with user's comments and also timestamp. And uh, so this makes the probability very hard to estimate. And uh, so balancing the data with the confounders hidden behind the activity data is very challenging to existing uh, balanced method like uh, what we discussed just now. So in order to tackle this challenge, instead of balancing the data samples, we try to borrow the power of large language models. We propose that we can learn, we don't learn the balanced data distribution. Instead, we learn a balanced representation space through large language model and time series encoder. So what we do is like first, we use those large language models to encode the user's comments, like maybe BERT, and then we forward them into a time series encoder like an RNN together with a timestamp. And then we fine tune the encoder to jointly maximize the likelihood of the observed data as well as minimizing the prediction accuracy, percentage minimizing the prediction accuracy of the treatment assignment, which means that we are trying to exclude the information about treatment from the confounders and the covariates. In this way, we are actually making a Nash balance where giving the confounders is not helpful for predicting the treatment. In this way, we exclude the effect of the confounders. And as we can see, after applying this kind of LMM and RM boosted uh, balanced representation learning method, we can see that the performance is uh, significantly boosted compared to the uh, baselines. And uh, so the next question will be that, what can we do for the future on this direction? So a very key point is that if you, if you uh, in the aforementioned paradigm in that paper, we use LM as an encoder to encode the text and the timestamp, right? So this is only applicable when you are using some BERT, on, uh, uh, using some encoder only architectures like BERT or some encoder decoder LM like T5. Then you have an encoder, you can encode the text. But recent uh, advanced uh, um, large language models like ChatGPT, like El Lama, all of them are with decoder only system. They don't have such kind of encoding architecture. So the problem is that if we have such kind of decoder only large language models, how should we use them to help us to balance the data? That will be a key, uh, key uh, research direction that we can explore for the future things. Like, uh, of course, there are some very straightforward way, like you can use the likelihood is predicted to, as some score to predict, but still uh, uh, the, the perform there are still some troubling issues, like it will be overconfident or it will be less uh, confident and the likelihood is predicted is always not so accurate. So how should we tackle this issue? It's still a very open problem in this uh, causal inference for social media data. So, okay, so that's the end of this uh, section. Do you guys have any uh, questions about this section of causal inference? Yeah. If not, maybe we can think we can move forward further to this uh, large language model and uh, uh, misinformation detection. So I think that this could be some, some very hot topic, uh, topic recently. So, um, so the, the large language model's strong capacity in tackling the natural language inspired uh, uh, researchers to apply the large language model to help us uh, detect the misinformation. 
So the existing works mainly apply the following three types of paradigm to apply larger models in misinformation detection. So the first paradigm is that we directly do the detection with internal knowledge that are encoded in the large language models already. And the second way is to do some external knowledge to do the detection, like RAG, retrieval augmented generation. And the third way is that we don't ask the large language model to give us the final decision. Instead, we ask the large language model to perform as a supporter that helps us to uh, to draw the linguistic cues. And then we train a separated model, like a small model or a, or a, a, another model to uh, to encode the RM uh, generated results as some cues and then do the final prediction. So first I will introduce the, the paradigm of using the internal knowledge. So this is very, most, uh, very straightforward. It basically just like we design some prompt we attach the prompt on the large on the misinformation, and then we forward them into the large model to do the uh, to do the uh, to do the detection, and then it will use a long, long language capacity and its internal knowledge to you know acquired from the pre-training corpus to do the detection. So such paradigm is applicable for when in these two scenarios. First, the misinformation can be recognized linguistically. For example, it contains two strongly distinguishable information, uh, linguistic paradigms, uh, but no, linguistic uh, patterns. Like uh, it gets some very strong emotional bias or it gets some internal contradiction so that you don't have to use external knowledge. Internal knowledge to the linguistic will be enough for the large language model to do the, to do the prediction. And the second kind of way is, uh, the uh, second kind of scenario is that the associated fact has already been covered by the pre-training corpus or the fine-tuning corpus. Like, for example, for a lot of urban legends, they have already been discussed over and over and over again. So everybody knows that it's not true. So the RM can help you to make the decision. However, sometimes the chat GPT cannot respond correctly or clearly. Like, they will refuse to answer your question, saying that I cannot answer this question. So some researchers try to make some statistics. Uh, I said the paper here on the misinformation samples where uh, ChatGPT gives unclear responses. They require the ChatGPT to make a choice within four reasons why they refuse to provide the clear responses. So please remember, the A mean external knowledge refers to the factual uh, information, expert suggestions, or data reliability. It means that they need re external knowledge. Okay, now here, this is the statistic. You can see that for all the cases, for different data set, for different uh, models, A is always the top two choice of, chat, uh, of the model. So this tells us that the option A, which means that the model requires external knowledge, is always the dominant reason across different data with different languages. You see there are some data set with Chinese and some data set with um, English. So to tackle this issue, researchers propose that, yeah, we can use some external knowledge. Like to incorporate external knowledge with large language model based uh, misinformation detection, researchers propose to borrow the idea from uh, retrieval augmented generation. So basically what they do is like they have some, uh, some information to be verified. And then they just uh, use some uh, API to, to get some information from internet, like from Google. And then they do some consistency uh, evaluation across different kind of modalities to help them to verify the information. <coughs> All right. So the central idea uh, of this um, uh, of this kind of uh, retrieval augmented uh, paradigm generally convert the content to be verified as a series of queries. And then the model will call the API to require the relevant document from the database or internet as, as augmented contact for verification of the queries. And so these are the two straightforward way. You, in this two straightforward way, you are always trying to use larger model to make the prediction for you. But there are also some models saying that, uh, uh, papers saying that uh, the RM's great capacity is for general purpose in context of learning. So it enables us to uh, acquire knowledge from a few examples. But in some cases, we may expect, uh, we may have some a lot of data, right? We may have maybe thousands of labeled data, 
So in this case, you cannot all give all of this uh, uh, label data as context, right? Because the content window of, uh, of large language models is also very, very uh, limited. So in such a case, we mainly expect to learn more targeted detector based on the uh, middle scale data set that we acquire. So in this case, people propose that we can use a frozen large language model to generate some analysis to the text. And then with this analysis of the text, we train a small model that takes such analysis together with the context and make the, uh, make the uh, prediction. So the, in this way, we can use the knowledge in the frozen large language model together with the label data set of middle scale. So they should, uh, so in such a case, uh, the, so basically they will uh, extract the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, ask the large language model to give you some rationales and then train a, a fine tunable model to uh, make the prediction. And you can see that when you incorporated those small models with uh, large language models rationales, it performs better than both uh, small learned model and those uh, large language models. So basically, we have discussed the current uh, uh, current progress of the large language model based uh, misinformation detection. So in these three paradigms of uh, large language model based uh, misinformation detections, there are still some challenges. First, the challenge: how do we get? Uh, how do we do reliable real time data retrieval? So. Well, if the misinformation has already existed for a long time, then you, when you do, when you are doing the retrieval on internet, you can get a lot of uh, all the right, uh, a lot of information from all the right resources that can be reliable. But in the early stage, when the misinformation are spread on the internet, you don't have so much verified information. All you get are like semi misinformation and semi true information from retrieval. In this case, how should we construct the reliable external knowledge base in real time? That could be a very interesting and important question. Second problem, multimodal learning. Multimodal learning is very uh, is a very uh, critical and you know there are uh, people are publishing a lot of papers, but there are some differences. Usually when we are talking about multimodal model learning, we are talking about the images, right? That's, that's most of the people refer to multimodal learning. If you check the papers from both you know, natural language processing like EMLP or SL, or the paper from CPR from multimedia, right? From, from ACM multimedia. But the difference here is that for misinformation detection, images are not the most dominant kind of multimodal data. There are other modalities such as structured data, like graph structure data, like uh, the ta table data, will be as important as region data. But currently, the large language models are not, you know, targeting on such kind of data. So it's also very critical about how to enable large language model to reason on the text of such kind of data. And uh, the final challenge that I want to talk about here, but uh, definitely not the final challenge in this scenario, is that the prompting and reasoning strategy for the misinformation detector. So the existing works have shown that the differences in prompting and the reasoning strategy can significantly influence the performance of the model. So for example, the chain of thought can increase the performance for different kind of larger models like ChatGPT or LLM. So problem is that, how should we do to uh, develop more effective prompting and reasoning strategies targeting uh, misinformation detection? That will be the challenges. So we are going to talk about these three challenges one by one. So for this real-time data set constructed on uh, high end, are you here? Uh, seems like. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, hi, hi. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, so uh, Professor Yan Liu will uh, introduce uh, about some uh, uh, work from our group, but not from me, about the real-time reliable data set construction. Yeah, thank you, Ijo. And uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Sorry that I have to deliver this part of the tutorial through remotely because my son getting sick. Uh, but this is a really important topic. As we all know, for any machine learning or AI models to actually work, we need to actually get effective data in sufficient amount in order to train the model. 
So one of the major challenges we're facing for misinformation uh, is basically that the topic will change over the time. And therefore, whatever data we collected before may not necessarily be the best and most eff effective data sets to actually train uh, the most urgent and also timely topic on misinformation. So to tackle this emerging events, what we're doing is that we really need the real-time data collection so that we'll be able to actually re, um, construct some reliable information uh, bases so that we can actually confront, uh, we will be able to uh, get the right amount of data. So when we look at this, I think I motivate this a little bit is that there's actually quite a few challenges. The first one is that when we talk about any misinformation uh, labels, that we basically will be lack of the reliable news sources. Uh, when we look at uh, all the um, misinformation, especially at early stages, when it actually propagates throughout the internet, only a few, you know, medias actually acquire reliable information, and, and the majority of them will be uh, at the beginning stages where there is a lot of um, uh, misinformation actually in the gray area. And the other uh, challenge that we're facing is that it's really high cost in human verification. Uh, so let's say that even though that we resort to human uh, labelers asking either an experts on a particular topic, uh, or let's say that we ask a mechanical Turk to actually labeling the information for us, it will be first of all extremely cost um, sensitive in the sense that uh, we will need to pay a lot of money in order to get the labels. The second of all is even for domain experts on a specific topic, their labels can actually be reliable to a certain extent, but there is a lot of noise uh, during the labeling process. And therefore, from that perspective, we're really handling this dynamically changing environment where we would like to get uh, a good amount of labeled data in order to actively monitor misinformation at, within a short time. Uh, and then at the same time, the labels needs to be reliable. Uh, so we experience this particular challenge when uh, we work on misinformation detection uh, during the pandemic, when uh, the COVID-19 first hit us uh, in around, you know, February 2020. Uh, 20, where that we basically are interested in collecting uh, this misinformation. The way that we do this um, in this paper that is still in archive, but got a lot of citation because it serves as one of the major outlets for misinformation on uh, COVID-19. Uh, the way that we do this at that time is really that we have collected all the tweets around COVID-19 at that time was called coronavirus. Uh, and then we actually will have to act uh, doing the human labeling, basically that for each particular tweet, uh, we're going to go to uh, the fact-checking website uh, and then doing the labeling for different type of uh, tweets. And then among the misinformation, uh, there's actually different types. So example, this is conspiracy, something are actually uh, rumors, something are actually unverifiable. So from that perspective, as we can see, uh, that is it literally demands so much labeling um, efforts that uh, my PhD students in the whole group was helping um, um, for these tweets that we have collected uh, during the pandemic in the first few months, but also that uh, there are a lot of finer resolution of the labels we need to acquire, because it's not only just saying whether this is misinformation or not, but actually there's going to be a specific different types of misinformation uh, as I mentioned in terms of conspiracy theory uh, or unreliable information and et cetera. So in the next slide, um, so this is the work that uh, we actually published uh, in uh, the web conference two years ago. Uh, we were able to actually develop uh, this large-scale mis misinformation labeling system uh, by extracting a lot of different informations. Uh, so basically that uh, we developed this real-time algorithm to construct a large-scale misinformation labels. Uh, based on human-computer collaboration. 
And so this uh, particular graph basically demonstrate a basic idea of the process of how we are able to achieve this. Uh, the idea is that once we get uh, the uh, uh, tweets that we collected from uh, social media, this can be obviously from tweets, uh, that is from Twitter, or this may be from Reddit or from other type of social media platforms. Uh, so one way that we do this is that uh, we first are going to acquire some weak labels uh, by going into this new source credibility uh, checking, fact checking um, um, uh, data set. Uh, this, um, uh, we in there that we are able to actually construct a list of uh, fact checking resources. For example, the media bias fact, news guard, uh, Zindars, and etc. Uh, on these uh, fact-checking uh, data set, obviously that they will be actually collecting uh, some of the timely misinformation and facts uh, right now. Um, obviously, these uh, websites are not perfect. That means that a lot of these misinformation can actually not be showing up in there. Uh, and therefore that we call this as weak label. So we're going to, for each tweet, uh, we're going to search on these uh, misinformation, uh, on these fact checking website and uh, to collect the labels in terms of whether this is misinformation or uh, true information. And then based on this mislabels. Me? So that is you. Yeah, that is me. Sorry. Um, so uh, in here that we're going to get uh, uh, build a detection model so that we will be able to actually build a um, um, yeah. misinformation checking website uh, models based on the weak labels. So uh, in addition to uh, this detection model, uh, what we're going to do is that we're also going to add some social context in there. Uh, for example, for tweets, we'll be able to get uh, the tweets um, uh, retweeting graph. That means that we'll be able to get you know, uh, the sources of where the information is tweeted. And then the second part is that where it has been retweeted. And by actually analyzing this retweeting network, we'll be able to get the social context. And this will be combined together so that we'll be able to get uh, the final prediction model. And afterwards, what we're going to do is that we're going to evaluate the tweets in terms of whether this are uh, high um, um, entropy label versus the low entropy label. So that means that for some of the detection models, uh, the detection model we're able to provide the probability and also the social context algorithm will also provide the, uh, uh, the probability of whether the uh, tweet is actually misinformation or not. And based on this, that we can evaluate the entropy. So for the high entropy, that means that it's uh, very unsure. We're going to have the human labels to provide um, um, uh, the, um, the labels. That means that there will be a human in involved aspect. So this will be human providing some uh, labels for the tweets that or for the information that is relatively low, high entropy. And this will be a relatively smaller set. And based on the tweets uh, of the labels, we'll be able to further refine the detection model so that for uh, the more uh, we can relabeling uh, the tweets that we collected and so that we can further um, uh, refine it. And then for the tweets that we actually have low label entropy, that means that, you know, we are pretty sure in terms of our confidence uh, of uh, the um, labels, whether this is misinformation or not. Uh, based on for these tweets, we're actually going to uh, have a, a classroom algorithm. Basically, we do this class prototype using the k-nearest neighbors so that we will uh, only, we're providing not only, you know, whether this is actually misinformation, but also providing uh, in terms of whether this is false, uh, this is mostly false mixture or um, unproven. So that means that we're going to provide finer resolution of the labels that for the tweets that we have more confidence. Uh, so this is, you know, representing one type of the real-time uh, um, uh, labeling system we can provide. And, and uh, next, uh, we're going to show the experiment results to quickly show uh, that um, uh, 
basically that this is our uh, detection algorithm that is we're providing both the social information plus the prediction model and also with the label corrections uh, we're able to achieve pretty good uh, performance in terms of labeling accuracy comparing with other uh, methods that we're able to get uh, five um, to um um, uh, uh, five to eight percent improvement in terms of different type of evaluation metric. Uh, we think that this basically provides you know a, a highlight and also uh, a particular promising directions where we will be able to actually build uh, this real time labeling system with very minimum labeling efforts. Uh, do you mind to go back to the previous slide, Ijo? What I'm going to highlight is that now, given the ChatGPT uh, and uh, some of the um, um, automatic fact-checking uh, algorithms, so that we will be able to actually add in uh, additional information. That is, for the new source credibility, we'll be also able to add more LL models uh, and also other type of uh, um, uh, language models so that we'll be able to provide automatic uh, labeling uh, with the weak labels. And that means that that even with the uh, ChatGPT and other LM model, we will be able to uh, continue utilizing uh, this um, uh, extremely uh, flexible framework so that we can still uh, achieving this real-time labeling uh, based on this framework. So uh, this is the part in terms of the real-time labeling. Uh, I want to just pause here to see if we have any questions. And by the way, this time we got a microphone, so we can, uh, if you have any questions, you can use the microphone too. Uh, do you have any questions on this topic? Okay, seems like you're okay or all okay with this part, right? Yeah, hi, I think we, maybe we can move on. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, thank you yeah, so much. It's all really troubling too. And then I will invite uh, my collaborator uh, Lun to present some works about how to incorporate the large language models with structured modality data, including both uh, graph data and also the tablet data. And once again, the, for the newcomers of this tutorial, the, all the tutorial materials are here uh, in the barcode of the, of the right corner. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, we seem to have not sharing. Okay, share your screen. Yes, this one. Okay. Thanks, Yijo and Yan. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to introduce the next part. Uh, that is incorpor uh, incorporating LM with structured multi uh, modality data. Uh, here we are going to discuss two types of structured data that are widely used on the internet and various data databases for retrieval. These are tabular data and the graph structured data. Let's start with tabular data. This type of data is extensively used in relational databases and the spreadsheet applications. An example uh, would be financial statements. Financial statements are a collection of reports about an organization's financial results, financial condition, and the cash flows. They are fundamental to the task of financial analysis and provide valuable insights into uh, companies' operations. This makes tabular data basic and a crucial data structure for data analysis. And moving on to uh, graph structured data, this type of data is ubiquitous in the real world. It is a basic data structure used to represent complex relationships. Examples of graph structured data include knowledge graphs, and the citation networks. Knowledge graph 
uh, a type of structured uh, <coughs> structured data uh, that represent a collection of interlinked uh, description of an, uh, entities, object, uh, objectives, uh, events, or concepts. They provide uh, a structured and comprehensive representation of facts about these entities and their relations. Citation network is another example. Uh, they are a type of graph structured data that represent the citation relationships uh, between publications. They are used extensively in uh, bibliometrics and the scientometrics to analyze the impact and the dissemination of scientific research. Now let's dive into how large language model or LMs can interact with structured data, particularly in the context of misinformation detection. To effectively detect misinformation, we need to handle structured data in various scenarios. Firstly, we often encounter scenario, uh, situations where text and the structured data appear simultaneously as context. For instance, a, VP, a Wikipedia page might contain a table of structured data alongside the main text. In such cases, the structured data can provide authoritative explanation or additional context that can help verify the information presented in the text. Secondly, structured data such as knowledge graphs can be used for grounding LMs. Knowledge graph represent a collection of interlinked description of entities, providing a structured and comprehensive representation of facts. By grounding LMs in this structured data, we can enhance their ability to understand and reason about the world, thereby improving their performance in tasks like, like misinformation detection. Lastly, we can also equip LMs with the ability to reason about structured data directly. This can be particularly useful in scenarios where the structured data itself contains the information needed to verify or refute a piece of information. However, incorporating structured data with LMs is not without its challenges. The first challenge we face is the difference between plain text and structured data. LMs are trained on plain text. Can, can they understand structured data? And if so, how do we input structured data into these models? To illustrate these challenges, let's consider a table example. When we look at this table, we see rows and columns filled with data. We can easily understand the relationships between the data points and, the draw, con <coughs> and the draw a conclusion based on the information presented. However, the large language model says a, a table. It doesn't say it in the same way we do. Instead, it say a sequential form of the table. For example, uh, the markdown uh, form. This form is quite different from the two-dimensional uh, two dimensional structure of a table that we are used. This difference in perceptual poses a significant challenges for LMs when dealing with structured data. So the question is, how can we bridge the gap? This is one challenge we are confronted with when incorporating structured data with large language model. Okay, next is the second challenge, which is reasoning on structured data. There are two main approaches to reasoning with LMs, semantic reasoning and the symbolic reasoning. Semantic reasoning is where we hope that LM can directly reason on the structured data. This approach is more intuitive and aligned with how human naturally uh, reason. However, it's important to know that LMs are modeled through probability in models, which inherently have uncertainty and can lead to unavoidable hallucinations. On the other hand, symbolic reasoning involves using semantic parsing technique to convert user queries into a programming language for data querying. This approach is deterministic and often involves numerical calculations, which makes it more robust against the hallucination and the advantages in handling numerical reasoning. So the question we need to ask is that can LM work well on structured data reasoning? For example, uh, like data analysis or uh, verification? This is a crucial question as we strive to improve the performance of LMs. 
in, uh, in this kind of tasks. Okay, let's uh, dive in, uh, deeper into how we can incorporate structured data with uh, LMs. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, tabular data and the graph data respectively, uh, and we, can, uh, we will start with uh, tabular data. We need to design a table input that can be easily understood by LMs. This involves transforming the table into a format that the LM can pro uh, precise and understand. Once we have a suitable table input design, we can then use the LM to reason on the table tabular data. Uh, moving on to the graph data, we again need to design a proper graph input. Uh, and uh, also we need to, uh, uh, to reason on the graph data. Here we introduce a recent work titled uh, Table Meets LM. Uh, this work conducted a systematic uh, empirical study to answer the question, what input design and the choices are the most effective in enabling LM to understand tables? They define the different stages of table understanding capabilities as shown in figure 1a. For instance, during the partition and the, pa and the parsing stage, we can understand the structure of the table based on its format and other information. The specific input design can be found in figure 1b. For example, for the sterilization of the table, different uh, markup languages can be used, or, language, or nature language and uh, delimiters can be used to describe them. Then by designing appropriate tasks, we can evaluate LM's ability uh, understanding ability of the table. Here is two example tasks for cell lookup. An example question could be, what is the position of the cell content, cache and the cache equivalents? Use row index and the column index to answer. And for site detection, an example could be how many rows in the table. It's, it's a, a really simple task to, uh, to judge the LM's ability to understand the uh, table. The evaluation result on table formats can be seen in, the, in this table. The column with the uh, name uh, ACC uh, is the accuracy of the GPT 3.5. Uh, and, and the column GPT 4 is the uh, uh, accuracy of uh, GPT 4. From the result, we have the following finding. That is, LM have a basic understanding of table structures, but are far from perfect, even in straightforward tasks like detecting the number of columns and rows. Uh, and the ablation uh, study of input designs can be seen in the table two. We can find that choosing the right combination of input design can significantly input, uh, enhance LM's understanding ability of structured data. One more interesting exploration in this work is to investigate how LM's existing knowledge could be used to enhance their understanding of, under, uh, of structured data. They introduced the self -augment augmentation technique that improves structure prompting by enabling LMs to identify key values and the ranges by typing into their own internal knowledge. To be specific, the technique allow LMs to generate intermediate structure insights showing the green part of this figure. Okay, next we uh, introduce LM for reasoning on tabular data. In this part, uh, we will focus on an example uh, to introduce table uh, reasoning. This example is misinformation detection on the table. Uh, this table is about a baseball game series. From this table, we can entail a statement that is the game on October 16, be the longest game in the 1982 World Series. On the other hand, we can refute a 
statement. The game on October 16 be the only game longer than three minutes in the 1982 World Series. Because we can find the game on October 17 is also longer than three minutes. To verify these statements, uh, to, to verify these statements is our task. As mentioned before, we have two paradigms to solve this type of reasoning problems, namely a semantic reasoning and a symbolic reasoning. The former, like the first question style on the slide, requires the LM to give a direct judgment and uh, can also ask for a text version evidence. The latter is like the second question style, which requires LM to give a specific query code and the user can execute it to get the result. Here is a specific symbolic reasoning prompt and the answer and the answer from GPT-4. In the prompt, we ask the, for a SQL code to answer the verification question. And also we input the meta information of the table. GPT-4 can give a great SQL code for, the, uh, for this specific question. Overall, at the present, both paradigms have their own advantages and a lot of related research work is being carried out. However, because symbolic reasoning, or we can say uh, now to hold, is easier for grounding and uh, for error correction. Uh, and uh, it is easy, um, relatively easier to avoid unpredictable hallucination. Uh, in the industrial, it is uh, used uh, um, more frequently. Okay, let's move on to the graph input design. Uh, here we also introduce a uh, retail work uh, recently. Uh, it's named the uh, GPT-4 graph. Uh, similar to the work table meets LM, this work also conducted a systematic uh, empirical study to show the ability of LM in understanding graph structure data. The main difference is there are more kinds of tasks related to structural understanding on graph data. This work explored uh, serialized graph with different kinds of graph description languages and a different prompt design to fade LMs. The graph understanding tasks into two categories, structural understanding and semantic understanding. For structural understanding, we ask LM to detect, retrieve, or calculate structural information of the graph, such as graph size, node degree, uh, graph uh, diameter, and the clustering coefficient. The semantic understanding task is more like reasoning task, including KGQA, uh, graph query code generation, and the uh, node or graph uh, classification. Uh, the structural understanding results are shown in this table. The results suggest that the input design has a, a significant impact on the structural under uh, understanding. For example, uh, the graph input uh, format for GML, uh, the third line, the third main line, uh, main row, uh, showed, uh, it shows the great advantages in size uh, detection task. Uh, however, edge list is more effective for diameter calculation. It means we have to uh, do more investigation when we uh, do a specific task uh, for choosing the uh, input uh, forms of graphs. Okay, and also we're going to talk about reasoning on graph data. Uh, similar to reasoning on the table, the reasoning on graph has, uh, also has two paradigms, semantic reasoning and symbolic reasoning. On this slide, there's a case of uh, semantic reasoning. And uh, there is also a case of a symbolic uh, reasoning. Uh, in this case, we hope that LM can help us verify the following statement by writing a graph query. Uh, the statement is Professor He is the scholar with the most citation in the field of deep learning. 
LM, the, the output of LM uh, shows that it can provide the validation uh, conclusions by calculating the paper cita citation degree. Okay, uh, that's my part. Thank you. Do you have any questions on this? Uh... Okay. Yeah, I think uh for LM uh, for LM it it is uh better for zero shot tasks. So when we have a graph without a lot of uh, labelings, we can use LM to uh, provide our some knowledge uh, somehow about some uh, uh, annotation or some mm -hmm. external knowledge. Uh, it may help our uh, a specific task. And if we have enough uh, annotations, I think uh, currently uh, di directly use LM to solve graph uh, problems are not very, uh, are not, are not better than a specific graph model. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, did you look also at the attention mask and if it really makes sense in, let's say, different uh, representations, uh, whether there are some representations in which basically the attention is better matching the data that the goal that is being asked? Uh, can you reason a bit about that looking into the input or did you not uh, study it in that way? Uh... Sorry, can, can you <laughs> explain your, your, your question again? Uh, so, uh, the transformers and the uh, LMs are looking at the attention of the input, and basically they can look that certain uh, parts of the input are important combinations to do And uh, I would expect that basically if you are looking at both the tabular data or the graph data, then uh, basically it should, the attention should be able to be like that this is the important mm -hmm. uh, aspect of data. But basically, correct on to the question that the user is asking. I'm asking if you see a difference in the attention based on the representation that is the input, uh, whether there are some types of representations whether in the table uh, it is markdown or HTML or XML, whether some of these representations are basically better in order to nicely match the attention and understand our words. Uh, yeah, uh, I think um, maybe it's not about the uh, the basic uh, backbone of LMs. Uh, you mean the uh, transformer. Yeah, we, we know the, the basic uh, uh, concept of a transformer, but uh, I think the most important is the, the training data format. Uh, if we, uh, if the pre-trained data is more formatted as the uh, markdown uh, for tables, maybe uh, LM will do better in, uh, in markdown style. Yeah, I think it, it's, uh, it's, it's a possible uh, explanation. Um, yeah, for, for more detail the, about the backbone uh, structure, uh, how this structure uh, affect the, the input forms, it's, it's uh, still need our, our research, yeah, conduct more research. It's a future direction, I think. Yeah. We don't have the last question for this sector, right? Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm uh, just wondering, like, for, you, you talked about like semantic and uh, symbolic methods, and I wonder, like, for more complicated graphs, like uh, when the graph can get really big and stuff, mm. like which method will, will work better? Like, for example, I expect like uh, this uh, the symbolic method will be needed because the pure neural or like semantic methods may suffer from like uh, getting to know something knowledge inside a graph or something. I'm just wondering what's your take on this. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree with you. So I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think uh, symbolic uh, reasoning is, um, is more reliable and uh, uh, more uh, um, better for for large graph. Uh, I know, uh, but in uh, in or in recent research, there there are also another line of work for semantic uh, reasoning. Uh, they they may uh, sampling the graph, uh, such uh, such as uh, RAG. Uh, they retrieve the related part of this graph and then uh, use uh, semantic part, uh, semantic uh, mm -hmm. reasoning on this uh, small graph, and, and it can also uh, do better in some cases. So, so the comparison, uh, we need more research on the, this comp comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, final part of this um of this tutorial so uh, back let me go back What is, is that not our tutorial? Um, okay, so. Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, more content about uh, the finally we the final uh, um, so the final uh, uh, topic that we hope to discuss is about how to design the good prompting and reasoning strategies for misinformation detection. So the first thing, uh, first empirical finding that I want to share with uh, people here is that multiple recent papers validate one phenomenon very similar uh, empirical finding that divide and conquer prompting and reasoning strategy can specifically uh, benefit the detection of hallucination and the verification of fact and misinformation, especially when the input is very long. So the divide and conquer means that, for example, you are given a material and you want to uh, verify whether a summary is correct or not. So what do you do? Uh, usually people will just say, hey, Please tell me whether this summary is correct or not. But divide and conquer means that you separate the summary to be a series of you know, like a queries or a sentences or anything, any fractions. And then you verify them one by one with the large language models. And finally, you merge the result. Then you do the prediction. If you follow this kind of revenue strategy, it generally gives you better performance in all kinds of verification, including both uh, hallucination generated by large language models and also the misinformation uh, written by humans. So here is uh, 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 a table from this paper. There are a lot of papers from different groups all over the world. One paper is from our group, one paper is from the Vanderbilt University, and also a lot of other uh, works. So all of us find, perhaps just in a very short time window, we all of us find that the, this kind of divide and the conquering profiting and uh, uh, prompting and reasoning strategy can help us to perform to boost the performance of large language models. So here you can see that this is a table from my paper. So you can see that the divide and conquer generally outperform all the things, including L prompting means the most standard uh, prompting, and also outperform chain of thought, chain of thought self consistency, choice of thought, and at least to most. So the question is that why such kind of uh, divide and conquer prompting strategy becomes sort of a golden uh, way to, to do the verification? 
So one of these papers, of course, my own papers, the provide the uh, uh, theoretical uh, explanation of these findings. So the retrieval-based factor verification can actually be regarded as a subtree isomorphism problem. So here we can, this is an example. So we have a material, we have a news, and we want to verify whether the news is consistent with the material or not. So this kind of question is pretty much like that you have a short, you have a small tree, which correspond to this news, and you have a big tree, which correspond to this material. You, you can imagine that these trees are the semantic trees of the tree expressions of the, uh, of the text. And then what you are trying to do is to say, hey, is this small tree a subtree of this big tree? This is called as tree isomorphism problem. So this is a, 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 a this is more like a graph theory problem in um, in the theory and computation uh, computer science, and we got a really uh, uh, I have to say very uh, promising and exciting uh, theoretical results, which is that so we prove that for a fixed large language model, actually for most of these things like ChatGPT, like the uh, LMA, there are always fixed numbers of layers, right, as a pre-trained model. So for fixed algebraic uh, models, they can all solve the tree isomorphism problems when the subtree is long enough. And uh, so, of course, under some well-recognized uh, assumption, like this is an assumption from the uh, theoretical computation, uh, computer science, and uh, it is basically as widely recognized as P does not equal to MP, yeah, something similar. So under this assumption, we can say that for any for any fixed large language model, there exists a length of the uh, of the small tree such that uh, when you get a tree that is larger than this uh, constant, the model fails. And we found that when you apply to another conquer strategy, the issue is, is solved. solved. So there exists a log precision transformer with fixed depth uh, and layers and the hidden dimension that can solve this uh, binary uh, uh, subtree uh, isomorphism problem with a fixed length of prompt uh, for uh, merge, uh, subtest and tackling, and task decomposition. So which means that you just need some fixed length, fixed number of fixed length uh, prompt. And with this prompting strategy, you can solve the issue. So that is quite like a good, uh, exciting uh, finding that tells us that simply changing the reasoning strategy and prompting strategy, you can make a large language model have better expressive power that can help us to tackle the verification of misinformation. So one of the above, uh, oh, sorry. So uh, this above uh, theoretical analysis explains why the demand of the conquer strategy is always making the model performance better. But this theorem, as we say that, we only prove that there exists this uh, transformer and exists this prompt. But we uh, we cannot specify that what kind of uh, dividing strategy, strategy we should use. So the existing works that I just uh, I just mentioned, the, the three papers, basically it's for a different strategy. So the first one is the most straightforward way to divide the paper, uh, to divide the uh, document. So this strategy directly segments the claim to synthesis and then evaluates the synthesis one by one. So this is really uh, straightforward, but even this straightforward way can um, effectively improve the performance of our uh, verification, especially for long news claims. Uh, the other, but, but you, some people may say that, hey, sometimes your synthesis is very long and what should we do? So for short, claim, uh, short claims with long synthesis, we can apply a parser, for example, an abstract meaning representation parser that can parse the text to be a graph. And then on the graph, you can do a uh, neighbor searching to construct this kind of queries. And with this queries, you can ask the model, like, is this query correct? Is this correct? correct? And finally, we merge all of them. So in this way, we can use a parser to help us to break up the claim as a series of short queries. So the final one that I hope to uh, uh, explain is that they are LLM-based dividing. So basically what they are doing is that for the claims containing long sentence, we can apply this uh, strategy to prompt the large language model 
to break up the claim as a series of short queries. Like we talk, tell the algorithm model, hey, please tell me what kind of facts are, 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 uh, are hidden behind this document. Under what kind of assumptions this document can be true and it will give you a series of queries. You verify them one by one, you can solve the issue. However, there is still a challenge, which is that the information the dividing strategies are very straightforward. Also, they are not learnable. You see that if we are saying the sentences, then yeah, it's fixed to be dividing with sentences. If you are fixing it to be a partner, then your partner is fixed and you get the fixed uh, the query. But the problem is that these dividing strategies are not learnable. So therefore, there's still a very wide space to explore on the dividing strategies. So the challenges will include, first, how can we develop trainable dividing modules? Like, how do we design the module that contain trainable parameters? This is the first challenge. The second challenge is if we have such kind of a learnable models with learnable parameters, how should we optimize them? What will be our optimization of, uh, objective function? What is our loss function? Because we don't directly have a, 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 a labeling function telling us that which dividing is good, which dividing is bad. Actually, this labeling function is even different for different large language models. You know, if, if for different large language models, they may have different uh, preferred way to divide the, the, the queries. So the, how to optimize the parameters if we have such kind of a learnable model is still a, 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 is still a, requiring us to explore how to do it. Okay, so thank you very much. That will be the end of this uh, tutorial. Thank you so much. So uh, if you have, then, so if, if you have any uh, questions, you can still ask. We still have a lot of time here from the launch. Yeah. Okay, so if you uh, also you. Um, like you mentioned, like the um, LLM divisions for divide and conquer. So I was just wondering, like yes. for for that method, what are some drawbacks of that? Because like the like each time the division may, may not be stable and they might like, not be controllable either. So like for that, although it seems to be uh, a nice idea, like what are some of the disadvantages of that method compared to like, the other dividing strategies? That, that's definitely a good news, a uh, good question. And uh, more importantly, you know, for different kind of news and for different kind of models, the dividing strategies are different. That's why we say that it is very important to develop a learnable and a dynamic strategy to divide the, the sequences. You know, for example, I, I give you different kind of things, but you know, they work in different scenarios. And for some models, this works better for some models that works better for some data this works better for some data that works better so that will be very dynamic on the system that's why it is really important for the next step is to learn the dividing strategy so basically you get a learn a strategy. so so basically if you can have some learnable strategy that definitely will be pretty much good work to present in top conferences yes yeah so uh, does any Anybody have any questions about this? Uh, if not, then I think maybe that will be the end of this tutorial. And I'm so happy to have a chance to share uh, these things with you. And I hope that uh, maybe in the future we can try to, you know, uh, uh, build up more papers, researches about this scenario and make it, you know, grow, grow up uh, uh, faster yeah, compared to now. Thank you so much. Yeah.